there's your interlock too. Now stretch them quite as Soccer and the fifth. Quiet, please. In exactly 15 seconds, we'll be on the air. I felt like a reptile. Oh. Like a reptile. I felt like a reptile. Easy. Hey, how you doing, mate? All good. How are you? Yeah, good. 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 You see me all right. I'm, I'm my back lit because I've got the sun's up. No, it's good, man. Hey, you're all good to be fair. You got a nice glow. There we go. A nice glow. Yeah. That's, I've been out pulling a few weeds up. I'm clearing a space because have you seen that rope thing that Tim Sheaf's been doing on his Instagram? No. Um, is it Human Timothy? I think that's his Instagram. Human Timothy. Have a look at it because he's got this thing he's been doing. This like heavy rope. Right. And uh, he sent me a message the other day and asked me if he could send me one. So he sent it me along with this document about it. And uh, it's it's really cool, man. It's like th there's a lot of crossover with like um, like some of the old school martial arts weapons, like moving it around the body and stuff, like the old like chain whips and rope darts and stuff. Yeah, it's like the way of the rope or something. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Seen... oh, shit, yeah. And obviously, how much time have I spent jumping rope? At boxing gyms and stuff, you know what I mean. So I've got like a few crossover tricks and yeah. that thing, you know what I mean. It, but like I've been I've been playing about with it a little bit. It's it's it, it's a lo it's a lovely bit of rope. It's a good quality bit of rope, you know what I mean. I can I can see me wanting to carry it around and uh, and use it. I'm He's making this look very easy. Of course he does. That's that's what he does, man. That's what Tim does. Like, I can do certain shit with the tea towel. I can do the whip. <laughs> I can do the snap. I can flick it over my shoulder. All that, but he's yeah, he's on next level here, dude. Yeah, he's good, man. He's he, he's very good. So yeah, I, I, I got the document emailed to me, and the uh, the rope came. So I'm, I'm gonna have a play about with it. I think if you look on that Polaroid that Davy T posted in his full reptile script top, he actually had a rope with him, and I don't know Is if he's gonna do a rope walk or if he was doing the rope flinging. I wonder if that's what he's doing. Then I wonder if. Uh... I wonder if he's a if he's a rope chucker. A rope chucker. Whatever they're called, I don't know. Oh, one day that'll be racist in some way or another. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean a hipster white dude? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is he wearing a is he wearing a fedora and some Chelsea boots? <laughs> yeah. Fence. Yeah. Call me a rope chucker. <laughs> is he wearing those strange shoes with the toes? <laughs> yeah. Oh Jesus creepers. <laughs> How are you all? Are you all good? Not bad, yeah. Just had, uh, dude. You, you, you looked, you looked fucked yesterday. Mate. One better word, there isn't a better word for it. You were knackered. No, uh, you I sent wasn't. me two photos. One, one of of your legs from like your knees down, which yeah. was just filth and work boots. Yeah, one of your face, and it looked like. Well, I, I reckon. I mean, we could probably drop it in. There's probably a, there's probably a technological way of doing this, which makes it look better, but. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna show everybody this right now. Look at that. Are we got to, oh the good thing with this is we've got a comparison. Look. I mean look at him clean now. Scrubs up all right. I mean his hair's a bit wild still, but mate. I look like the caddy off Happy Gilmore. You remember yeah. on Happy Gilmore when he goes back to pay that guy to be his caddy for the final tournament? He's like, you, yeah, look like, you look like you've been at sea on a fishing trawler for about eight weeks. I felt like it, man. And the thing is. It was kind of all time sensitive as well because we re the neighbours moved in and their dog could jump our fence. So <laughs> I got no dog. I got no problem collecting dogs, but people want their <laughs> dogs back. I don't like that. So I realised I had to put a barrier in. So once we'd pulled the posts out, it was one of them where it was like we have to do it now. I'm I'm past the point of anything. So. I've got to give a massive shout out to a lad, the lads at Heena Fencing, which is just up the road from me. But at the minute, there's a massive shortage on ballast and sand and all this other stuff for people delivering because a lot of the big places are shut. So ju just to clarify, fencing as in the barrier between your boundary and theirs and not... Yeah, not as in... Yet. Yeah, not as in on guard. So these fellas were already cheaper and they were just as good quality. I rang him up and I said, I need some ballast and some cement. And he went, all right, leave it with me. Rang me back. He went and collected it for me and sorted it out, then dropped it off and shoveled it into a tunny bag on my front for me. Honestly, 
I was blown away by their service. Mate, they're proper grown-up words. I have literally never, ever made a phone call asking someone to deliver me ballast and cement. I, if, somebody, if somebody delivered me ballast and cement today, I don't even know what I would do with them. Mate. Well, I, I don't want to see them again. I, want, <laughs> I mean, I know Veronica nearly threw up when she saw my hands yesterday. They're still not much better, so I'm not even going to show you. <laughs> Yeah, have, it, was, it was the filth under your fingernails. It looked like you were crossing over to the dark side. Oh, mate. The thing is, it's just, it, was, it wasn't even, I was just talking to Slim, it wasn't even the work, because I've, I've, I've done a lot of manual jobs. It was the sun. And, and the sun just literally laughing at you, because wherever we went, on our garden, on our back, it's a sun trap. So throughout the day, it just follows you around. And the last one we were putting in, we had two gravel boards, and a post and we needed because the next door's garden is slightly higher than ours so we had to dig a three foot trench and after digging that i was i looked at darren because i can't thank him enough he's one of my mates darren he's, he's an absolute legend and uh he's a machine when it comes to putting fences in so he said to me once we've dug this trench we're done so it's that tattoo thing again i was just like oh i literally dug the last bit and i was like is it level he went yep yeah. and I just lay back and i was like oh Thank fuck. And he went, but the post has got to go under the foot. And I was like, oh, go fuck. Oh, oh, no. So, yeah. So that nearly finishes off. But that's what literally 10 minutes after we'd done that, I rang you and you got the uh, Happy Gilmore caddy. Yeah. Stuffy looking motherfucker. <laughs> so, yeah. So all the all the holes that I would have had for burying bodies are now filled in. So when do we decide to have a massive, massive kid domestic? Right now. Oh, no. Uh, well, I don't want to dig anymore. So luckily, they're going to they're going to survive another day. <laughs> oh, are they falling out? Is it because of Lego? I wish it was. It's it's. I think the worst thing that I'm dreading is kids going back to school because at the minute they're already sort of forgetting what they used to have to do. Because now Stacey's at work, she comes in, and I've got the kids, and I've had the kids from say eight nine o'clock, and like I give them an easy go give them some breakfast, they watch the telly. But then it's like I'm booking a meeting with a fucking executive. So I go, right, darling, would you like to come and do some maths now? She's like, nah, nope. I'm not going to lie. I'm like, mate, it's 11 o'clock. You need to do some shit. And she's like, um, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. I don't want to do that. And it's like, oh. <laughs> so, yeah. Not I don't blame them. I would feel the same, I'll be honest. Yeah. Uh, mate, that's the problem. I know the grown-up stuff is bad. But I am more, I am 80, 90% kid myself. So when they kick off, I sort of feel it. But at the same time, I have to, I have to kick into adult gear just to remind them. And that yeah. not usually consists of me saying, I didn't have any of this. You've got everything. You've got the moon on a stick. How lucky are you? I grew up poor. And they're like, the problem is after a while, it's just like, whatever, dad. Yeah. That's, Fuck off. Uh, you can only use it so many times for the, for the weight of the, the, of the, the the sentence starts to wear off. See, yeah, I, I, I had a bit of a dilemma yesterday, and I had to I had to force myself to do the right thing. And I and I was proud of myself because when the postman came in the morning, he bought me two things. One of them looked a lot like a bill, and one of them sounded like it was broken. Lego, Lego. So I'm like, ah, and I know full well that if I open this this Lego box, I'm going to put the bill right next to the recycling bin and probably forget about it yeah that's the kind of thing that i do so i thought i'm gonna do the grown-up thing i'm gonna pay the bill first and then and the lego was so much sweeter the sun was out i had a cup of tea i mean i was proud of myself but then the thing is that i also realized this i'm like if if it took that amount of effort for me to pay a bill over building a lego set what happens when i go back to work that's it Imagine, imagine, imagine realizing you got to build a fence on the fucking hottest day of the year. Oh, no. like, okay, yeah, that... uh, I'm I'm not a fence kind of guy, really. I didn't think I was until I needed one, but it's expensive, man. That that's that's I'm in the wrong business. That's like, well, I'm not because I don't want to be doing it. But <laughs> that, that would have been like 1,500 quid, two grand. Yeah, but would you want to do it all fucking year round? No, but I would pay someone else and I'd be the gaffer. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'd be a wicked gaffer. I'd take bacon. Middleman. Man. Middleman. Yeah. Oh, I could middleman all sorts of shit. But <laughs> yeah, fucking horrible. The trouble is, my other mate who was meant to be helping us, and it's not even his fault, so I can't be mad. He said he'd help me at the weekend. 
it just so happened that Darren came on Monday and we started it Monday and we finished it yesterday. So when we, it's a mutual friend of mine and Darren's. So when we rang him, Darren was like, where the fuck are you? And he's like, I said, I'd be there Saturday. He'd not even done anything wrong. But yeah, he's, uh, I didn't, I didn't middleman that too well because I kept myself involved in it too much. Oh dear. Well, at least you could, you've got the feeling of accomplishment now it's done. Yeah, that and that I can't walk very well and move my hands too good. Well, yeah, but you know, yeah, there's so a lot. Of work. I mean, it's made you stronger. It was a good oh, workout. Yeah. You can rest for two days now, mate. Well, this is the thing. You know, like when, you know, when you're digging or doing something. You know, when you're watching fights and like people look gassed or they look exhausted, and you're just like, come on, just swing one more time, just fucking punch. And I mean, I've done obviously, I've done jujitsu, I've done uh, muay thai at Wayne's. I know how it feels. And it feels horrible. It's like you're drowning. And that's when you're just training. That's not it, even when someone's coming after you. That's why Francis Ngannou's clubbing people to death with his fish. You remember what his job was before he, uh, before he escaped to France? Was he a grave digger? Or was I he... Something. He was digging something. Digging mines, wasn't he? Something. I don't know. Digging. But you can imagine, like... You can imagine how much work he, work he put in over the years. Man. Man. I, you know, just on Francis Ngannou and talking about families... I think the whole John Jones thing and Engano, I think Johnny Bones has been on Amazon or somewhere else and found something he really wants that his missus has said no to because money's a bit tight for whatever reason. Because <laughs> John Jones has never mentioned money before. He's never been the one who's done the whole Conor McGregor. He's never screamed and shouted for big bills or all the big fights, has he? He's just dealt with everyone and just made it look easy for the most point. I think now he's the one and he's changed his tune and started saying, come on, show me the money. I think he's seen some fucking island he wants to buy somewhere or something where he can, I don't know, go and retire and live there. That she said, only if you get that, then you can have it. He's not, <laughs> not been greenlit. He's not been greenlit for something. You reckon that's what it is? Yeah, for real. I saw, I saw a comment because obviously we've got the video up on the channel of the, um, like the, the discussion with well, me talking about it and, and, answering questions about it and one of the comments was someone said like why, why would you in fact i'm going to read it i'm going to read it exactly because it was Don't ridiculous. Debate him. hang on where is it where is it thing is that i had to and unfortunately for him he caught me right as i woke up so i had to call him a dickhead as well but i'm not i'm not changing it are you are you going to change are you going to read your response to it as well as what he said okay. do you want me to i can do if you like yeah yeah i definitely want that I've got to find it first. I've got to find it. Oh, shit. There's a lot of comments. Yeah, there are. Yeah. Is many the of them... straw weight thing went up as well yesterday, and people are, people are enjoying it. That. amazing. I literally was making a drink for me and Stacey. So I waiting for the kettle to boil, and I watched the first two-minute preview, and je without even blowing smoke up the raptor's arse, I was gutted when it finished, the preview, because then I'm like, I'm going to have to find it now. <laughs> I was well into it. Yeah, it's good, man. I've watched it a couple of times. Really enjoy it. Honestly, the thing that lets it down is me. It needs I need more energy in my voice because I like I recorded it in my gym and I was like I was ready to train and I was fired up, but even so it doesn't match the the, the mood of it. You know what I mean? That's that'd be the difference. It's the difference with commentating in a in a room like for radio, watching it on a screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being on side, it's it's different. But I, I I can fix that. It's something for me to work on. Um, I've got a few things I'm working on, which is a bit of a bit of a challenge for me at the moment, like this pioneers thing I'm doing. Yeah, I, I, it will make more sense when people watch it, but it, I need to be a bit more of a storyteller in that. But, but anyway. do, you, do you ever get it where? Because obviously, I know I, I I haven't seen you for a bit, but do you ever have it where the raps will do a piece and send it to you, and then you decide where you're going to talk over it, or do you record and they have the audio, and then they decide where your voice comes in? Well, what, what we did with this, that straw weight thing, because that's a new thing that we're going to do. We're going to do more weight classes afterwards. That's the plan. Okay. Um, so um, the way it works is that they came up with the idea of, of doing that weight class, focusing on that kind of that journey of the belt. Yeah. So um, they kind of made something up, sent it over to me. I watched it and then thought to myself, I need to write a script to kind of make it, get it to make sense recorded the script and then sent it back and then they kind of edited around the script a little bit to make it a bit more accurate but oh. then i mean that like the, the the style of it's awesome i love it the music everything, everything. really cool i'm looking forward to getting into the next one up i'm not sure exactly what we're doing next um but what i'm what we're realizing is that 
when we do say like lightweight or welterweight, we're gonna have to do it in two parts. Because otherwise you're looking at something that's that's maybe even an hour long. Um, well, anything that was pre WEC acquisition, I I'm would say pre 2010. That's that's what I'm gonna do. There's a clean break in most of the weight classes. I've already had a look. Like oh. like in the lightweight division, that's where BJ Penn had won the belt. Yes. And then he defended it what twice before he fought Frankie Edgar. Yeah, but then he had that big thing, didn't he? He had the contract dispute. Is yeah. that when it vacated? Is that free? I don't, I don't remember exactly. No, because he, he lost it to Frankie Edgar, didn't he? Exactly. Frankie in Dubai. Yeah, but that, that's the, that's, that'll be the first part of the next episode of that week. Uh, okay. That's what we're going to do. I quite like that. Even if they did Pride as well, if they went through the Pride belt. Dude, I'm all over it. I, I want, But with, with the Pride, what I want to do with that is I want to go through the individual events. Yes. So, like, I wrote this. I wrote this show that I want us to want us to do. Um, I mean, the thing is, it's been difficult because we've we've not all been able to sit in the same room. So it's you know we're kind of just going to start getting back to that kind of stuff now, which will mean we can start working on these. But this time away has given us time to work on some of these projects which we've been talking about but not doing. Yeah. So with the Pride one, like say Pride one for example, you look at that and you go, and I'm I am literally going off the top of my head with this, but you've got. Um, uh, Gary Goodridge knocking out Oleg Taktarov. Yeah. You've got um, Hicks and Gracie against Takada in the main event. You've got Branko Sikatic getting disqualified for kicking that guy in the head on yeah. the ground, which, because it was kickboxing, was illegal. Yeah. And that guy had a massive knot on his head. Yeah. The other one is, um, you, you, know the, you know the guy out of Troy? Um, you know the one that, that got knifed in the neck? In here. Yeah. yeah. He he's zero and one at MMA. He had a go, didn't he? He had a go, and he fought on that card, and he lost. And uh, yeah. yeah, but yeah, so that that's a good example of like, I mean, that was a, like a three hour event. I could condense it down into like a fifteen or twenty minute story of like what that event's about, and then people can go and watch the whole thing if they want to. But like, there were a lot of events where you can kind of pick out four or five different key things and go, "This is what this event was all about." And, yeah. yeah. Like you'll remember, they kind of all blur into one after a while. That's, like you've got a better memory than me, but I, I, I struggle to remember what fights sat on what cards and where they were and what date. I mixed dates up all the time, so you know it's, it, it messed with my head. I've got a reasonably good memory up until it got mad popular that there's a lot of events. Yeah, so like the first say 15 seasons of the Ultimate Fighter, I'm pretty good with. Up until it was because it wasn't every week, so you'd have a couple of weeks to be able to talk about what's happened. And the drama that's unfolding. But what I would love to see, and this is something we can talk about with the Raptors, is maybe a timeline of just a year. So even if it's a, a if it's a um, strike force event running alongside a UFC event running alongside a Pride event, because then you're going to have someone who's still current, like Rampage or Vandalay or Crow Carp or Mark Hunt in Pride. Then you've got people who were in, in strike force like Fabricio Verdum and Robbie Lawler and all these other guys. And then ultimately, they've all come back in the end. They're all pretty much in the same. I'm very visual in my hands today. Sorry. No, um, no, no. You, you're you know hypnotizing I mean? me. I'm, I know exactly what you talked about there. Yeah, that's a good idea. But I just like seeing because it could be 2004 and it's like that weekend these three events were happening side by side. Like you've got the Strike Force brawl cr cracking off at the same time as Pride doing something and UFC doing something. And Bellator then comes in, and it's almost like a little timeline because I know that the history of the UFC really well, just because I've watched every fucking documentary there ever is. But like the new Fight Law thing they've done on Fight Pass is fucking brilliant. I love it. I absolutely love it because it just fills in a few little blanks for me that I've sort of like forgotten. Whereas if I've got, say, this is 1993, and literally it's just the UFC, and it shows you what events happened, a few little highlights from those events, you're like, okay. Whereas if you've then got Strikeforce, Bellator, Pride, and UFC running side by side, and you can see how the champions are sort of changing and fluctuating, because it was, was it Dan Henderson and Rampage? Dan Henderson came from Pride, the champ, didn't he? And yeah. fought Rampage in Manchester and lost. So then Rampage beat obviously Dan Anderson, but at least that sort of it quashed that that division from Pride a little bit. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, well, we'll talk to the Raptors, but I'd, I'd like to see it, if you know what I mean, yeah, just for my, my own personal collection. Yeah, that'd, that'd be good. That'd be good. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to getting into this, uh, this Pioneers thing, because I've picked out a few fighters that... Because like, oftentimes I'm, I'm Octagon side and I'm commentating on something, and I'll go, like, oh, shit, like, Pedro Hizzo's in his corner. And yeah. Then, like, as I say it, I know that, like, a good portion of the people that are listening probably won't know who he is, especially not not know who he is as a fighter or who, who he was as a fighter, like, how, how devastating he was, you know what I mean? Like, so, like, like picking out individuals and telling a little little story about a portion of their career. Yeah. I've got one I'm working on. I mean, as you know, we've bought a bit to, a bit of new kit, which is under my table, updating at the moment. Um, but I'm going to get get to Edison's uh, later today and have a play about with a few things. Have you had much of a play with it yet? Not really, no, not really, no. But it's, it looks nice, all right. Yeah, I've got I've got it set up. I've got it all set up. I've got my corners sorted out and stuff. Good. And I've, uh, I've downloaded a couple of bits. I've downloaded. I got my screen recorder in because I, I I need that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then Logic Pro, uh, Logic X. Okay. See, that's that's your the guy's sound, side. That's the sound yeah. software that Mystery talks about using. So I'm gonna play about that. I've got a few like old recordings of old records that I want to play about with. And anyway, yeah. I'm feeling well, more creative at the moment because I've got some time on my hands and the sun's out. That's good. Well, the sun's out, man. That's good. But yeah. with you saying Pedro Hizzo then, it just reminded me of something because it kind of blows my mind how many fighters have been and gone and have been absolute legends before the sport was even popular. Yeah. And I was talking to someone the other day and I was describing how much the kids had been insane since they'd been off. And I said, we've had more fights than Jeremy Horn. <laughs> and they didn't know what I was talking about. And they're MMA fans. And they were like, the what? I said, are you fucking sick? Like, this guy had had 100 fights by 1997. Yeah. Like, he, he's on a, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. He was, he cornered, I think he cornered Demarcus Johnson against Gunny Nelson at UFC on Fuel, which is your last fight against Amir Sadala. He was there anyway. Yeah, he was. I can't remember if it was with Gunny. No, not Gunny. He was either with DeMarcus. DeMarcus, it was. Yeah, you're right. I'm sure he was. Yeah. But, I mean, what a legend, right? Right. Absolutely. Fought Chuck down. He did. He beat Chuck once. Yeah. That's the only reason he fought him the second time, because Chuck was on a rampage. You imagine how Jeremy Horn felt. This mellow guy who's into jiu-jitsu beats a legend before he's a legend just just by being good, chokes him out, and then... Chuck's on a fucking rampage for the next 15 years, fuming, wanting to get his fight back. And Jeremy's like, yo, I just beat you, dude. I Mate, just beat you. I'll tell you what, I take that over being uh, over being Dennis Holman. By beating Matt Hughes twice before he became UFC champion and then him, and then forever being known for wearing those Speedos. Man. The last person ever allowed to wear Speedos in the octagon. You know it's it it sad. At the press conference. No more budgie smugglers. Done. No more. <laughs> but you know that Dennis Holman sat in a, a, a Wahoo's fish taco somewhere going, Matt Hughes, twice, mate. Did him twice. <laughs> and the guy counters that, I don't care. It's 750. Do you want your tacos or not? He's like, I beat him twice, mate. I beat him twice. Best welterweight in the world. Beat him twice. Yeah. But the problem is, the guy that he was talking to probably didn't even know who Matt Hughes was either. No, exactly. Because he's all about Conor McGregor. That's or it. he's all about... Bro- I think... What broke me more than anything was the Brock, the Brock side of things over the, cause obviously there's the, there's the original first, first run of UFC up until the ultimate fighter. You might've watched it before or the ultimate fighter might have hooked you in. After that, the next hook for me personally that I saw was Brock Lesnar hook. Cause even my little brother, one of my little brothers has always watched wrestling, never really been into the UFC, but the minute Brock came over was ringing me like, Oh mate, big fight this weekend, eh? Brock Lesnar against Frank Mir, and I was like, fuck off. Frank, yeah. Frank will sort it out, mate, don't worry. Which he did, luckily. I mean, luckily, we had a shit referee that night, and luckily, Frank's a, a fucking ninja when it comes to leg locks. But it was still a bit of a shit thing because it just dragged all these guys over. Yeah. And then the next, I suppose, the next break really is Connor. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's scary to think that, that Connor's been there long enough. Ronda, the gap, huh? Ronda, maybe. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Ronda. Yeah, it's a good point. It was just—I'm just looking at massive hooks, and obviously, 
you know, I mean, I, I was talking to Sam because he was he's into Formula One and he was talking to me about the UFC saying that all the jobs he's been out on the prior to the first fight that we had back, he said everyone was talking to him about UFC. And he said no one normally does. And it's because it was the first sport that came back and did it. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a couple of events to catch up on, haven't we? We have. We have. Which one? Uh, well, we've got... Do you want to go in order? Do you want Smith and uh, Teixeira? Yeah. What the funk? So, I was just talking to Slim about this. Because when we recorded, if you remember, I was saying that Glover had surprised me because he'd beaten... Was it Eon? Ion Cutelabra? Eon Cutelabra, yeah. Which was a big win in my eyes because he just sent like a ball of energy that was just not stopping for anyone. And Glover seemed to ride that storm and finish him. But obviously hindsight is always a motherfucker when it comes to fights because you look back and you can break it down. But what you told me at the time was you would have taken the rear naked choke over Gustafsson with Smith over... Glover's last fight or two. Last three. Last three, sorry. But if you think about it, when Smith fought um, Gus, Gus retired almost immediately. I don't think that, that Gus necessarily took Smith as seriously as what he wanted to because he already had one foot out the door. I'm not taking anything away from, from Smith beating Gus in any way. If that has come across in that way, I'm not trying to do that. But when you look at it, he had a really close fight with John Jones that went to the distance. So in his eyes, that's got to be a bit of an extra confidence boost because the pe- the best in the world can't finish you. The best yeah. in the world had nothing for you. Like, yeah, you didn't beat him, but he didn't beat you. Like, well, he won, but he didn't beat you, if you know what I mean. You're not dead. Yeah. So for him to go then and get Gus, and Gus is already one foot out, 65% Alexander Gustafsson, and him go, all right, well, I'll fucking have a go at this. All of a sudden, now that's uber confidence. Oh. Then when you're going to go and fight someone who's like, are you still yeah. there? Who's, who's, did that freeze or was that you? You froze a little bit, but yeah. you'd have you to do some fucking later. dances in the background so we know <laughs> that you're still. So for, for, for the matchmakers to ring Smith and say, all right, do you want, do you want Glover to share her? He's like, fucking hell, yeah, I'll take Glover. He's old as fuck. But... That old dog's got some fucking bite, man. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of, it's a little bit like uh, like the Overeem Harris fight in in some ways. Like, yeah, like I think Smith came in there. I, I'll be honest. I mean, and you can listen to the War Room, and any, anyone that listens to the War Room will know which way I was thinking the fight was going to go. I thought it was Anthony Smith to lose. I thought the best version of Anthony Smith beats the best version of Glover to share right now, and I, yeah. and I still kind of believe that that's probably the case. But Smith just, like, I think he came out, he, he looked real loose in the first round, but he poured pressure on like he was trying to get that first round finish. Yeah. And then when he realised Glover was back in there, there was a little bit of, like, a lack, a little bit of a, oh. And then yeah. Glover starts to, starts to creep a bit, you know, and he starts to come on. And, and I mean, that's just how Glover is, isn't it? And, I mean, Smith, Smith was durable, but like that at the end where he, I mean, that last takedown to guard pass to mount was, like, it was like hot, yeah, like, but. like butter through a hot knife through butter, wasn't it? It was like he didn't even really put up any resistance. He was done by that point. But um, there yeah. seemed to be a turning point in my eyes when I can't. Was it um, DC that was saying you can hear too much of the corner and the corner are instructing him go, 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 and he was literally fucking doing everything they said, which obviously put the crowd in there and you would probably lose 60% of that. And as much as he knows what his direction is, it's not as intense. It's not, it's almost like fighting with only your coach on the mat with you screaming in your face the whole time you're doing it, which I can imagine would be a weird feeling. Yeah. But there was one point where Smith, he was throwing the, the sweetest jab and just fucking holding him back. But then even though he was on the front foot applying pressure, he just sort of went like this and just stopped. And that's when Glover sort of stood back and then just started waiting. It wasn't even really making a lot of connection, but it's like Smith had thrown a lot out and then just sort of went, no, I've had enough. Yeah. I don't, really, I don't know if you noticed it, but he just seemed to put up this really, I don't know, it was, it's like a real, I don't know, basic guard. Just like if you yeah. just said, sort of, put your guard up to your nan, she'd be like, I'm ready. 
Yeah, it's just it's kind of like a soul wall guard if you just don't want to think about where the punches are coming from. You just you know that will block most things. Yes, that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Just it's just that's just that's kind of a get me out of here kind of guard. That's yeah. not. I mean that there's an argument for that not being intelligent defense in a lot of ways. Of course, yeah. it's guard up. But then, like, it gets to the stage, and I've I've been at this stage a couple of times in fights, and I mean, it, it's 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 not a nice place to be, but where you're so tired that it's actually easier to take the punch than it is to keep your hands up. Yeah. Because, like, by that point, you're as exhausted as your opponent, so they're hitting you with shots that don't really have a lot of power anyway. Yeah. I, I've been. I mean, when I was fighting out in Japan, the first fight in Japan uh, against uh, Daiso Ishige. A guy was a, just a he was just a monster. He just kept coming over and over again, just like just he was like a zombie. I could not I could not keep him back. Even in the third round, he wouldn't he wouldn't stop getting up and walking forward. And uh, but it got to the stage where like I was all I was interested in was hitting him because anything yeah. he hit me with, it, I, there was so little power in it that I was just like I'd rather just take it than block just it. Through it, yeah. It was yeah. But like you know, there is that that stage that you get to where you're just so exhausted. That's you know, it feels easier, and that's that guard is the stage before that. You know, before yeah. taking the punches because you you you're too tired. And I suppose as a fighter, when you're when you do put your guard up, your muscle memory almost automatically starts throwing punches, doesn't it? Yeah. Because if your guard is up, you're gonna start doing what you've trained. You're not you're not gonna be like, oh, just stay here because you never see someone apart from Caleb Starnes do that weird thing. You never really see it. You, you see people normally throw because Smith had a couple of wins like where he was just going, but Glover just looked like that. He looked like someone's dad or granddad that's been a legend in his day, gone into a local pub and sat down, and some lads have gone, he used to fight, you know. And the cock of the fucking school at that point was like, oh, yeah, he used to fight, did you, mate? And he was like, come on. And yeah. he just got up, walked outside let this guy just tee off on him for 20 minutes and then he just goes, and this guy's dead. And he's like, yeah. all right, anyone else? No, I'll go back to my pint. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Like a proper ropey British gangster film where, a bit like Harry Brown. You remember Harry Brown with uh, with uh, Michael Caine? I don't think I've watched Harry Brown. I'll tell you what I did start last night, though. It's season Good. five of um, uh, Peaky Blinders. How are you finding it? I, I, I love it. I, I really like it. I just struggled with the accent. Did you? I, just, I really struggled. Yeah. I, I don't mind it, but it was, it's, you know, when people, like, if you can't do a Brummie accent, then fuck me. You are not an actor, my friend. Brummie is probably the easiest. Just, I don't know, go, just ring Goddard for 20 minutes. He'll, he'll, <laughs> he'll sort it all out for you. Listen. Listen. I w- imagine if we could get him a little cameo in Peaky Blinders. Yeah. Can you imagine? He'd be a He'd be wreck. Great, wouldn't he? But still being a ref in like a barn somewhere. Yeah. With boys with flat caps on. He's like, listen, listen. That'd be, that'd be wicked. Like in in a, in a tent, in a fairground tent. Yeah. Let's yeah, make it happen, awesome. man. Yeah. But he's got to be shirtless with a pair of white trousers and a big blue bow on his fucking <laughs> shirtless <laughs> ref. No, fuck that. He's the referee. He's, he's, got, he's got a white shirt with the sleeves rolled up and, and the braces. Can we get him a twisty moustache? Of course, twisty moustache. Look at that! Look at that! That's impressive, mate. That's impressive. I keep trimming mine because it, it, it starts to annoy me after a while. But I really like I also it. trimmed the back of my, the bottom of my, my mohawk yesterday because it was starting to piss me off. It was getting a bit. It was, it was getting a bit Tiger King. I'll be honest. Mate, that's wait, well. It's if long. We, hat, though, if we could do that, we would. Li- I would like to get a. Uh, I'll, I'll try and make you one of the Tiger King hats and one of the camo jackets. With a knee support and a rifle. As long as you haven't sold all of those bloody camo hats. Dude, they've gone. What, what including mine? Did you save me one? No, 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 no. Yours will be safe. Yours will be safe. But I've got something to whet your appetite even more. I know we've only spoke about fighting for 30 seconds, but you have re- you have mentioned... Sorry, right, I want to talk about the next card anyway. I want to talk about the uh, more recent one anyway. There's this, more fun. There's well, lots, this, of, lots of interesting decisions. Did you watch the more recent one? Yes. Yeah, okay. and we'll talk about that. Right. Let me just the, show you this real quick. The other one, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't stay interested in the other one. No. I was very disappointed with Irvin St. Pru. Just running backwards. Just running just, backwards. I just I think sometimes people are re- they're really good athletes and they run aground when it comes to their first chosen sport, which I think in his case was football. And they're like, ah, 
let me have a go at that. You know what yeah. I mean? And it's like, and they just kind of apply those athletic skills to fighting. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you look at the way he moves and the, the, like the, the power that he hits with. Like, like you remember when he, when he knocked Shogun out running into the fence. Like, yeah. He's got the power. He's got the movement. Like the, the, the um, Patrick Cummins knockout. Like I, when we were breaking that down, when Ovin St. Prue was fighting John Jones, like I, I watched that knockout in, in like three or four different angles. And as he's moving back, like he's on one leg, his fist is coming up and he's like looking in the wrong direction. It's like, yeah. like he can't help but be athletic. He's so, he's, he's such a good athlete, he's so powerful. But I, I think there's always, you can only ride that, that athletic train for so long before it runs aground because there's always going to, there's always going to be that person like a Ben Rothwell who just fucking Homer Simpsons you who just yeah. walks forward and just mauls you and you and that's where you need that 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 bite that yeah. venom, that 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 get the fuck away from me kind of exactly. feeling I just don't yeah. see it you know what I mean anytime you look at anytime someone's looking up in their eyes there's this vulnerability and I'm just yeah. like this this person's out of the fight like I I, can't, I very really I, I very really score around for someone that is like is showing that kind of characteristic. It's so difficult for me to see them in any kind of winning capacity. And especially when they've been, you can almost say he's been to the top and didn't particularly perform. I don't know if something then has checked out in his head because if you watch the build-up video to him against John, his trainer was like, yeah, we've done this, we've done that. He's going to do come out and do this and that. It's never really been any of that fire since because it's been like, well... I've tried. I didn't really like it, but I need to cash a few more checks than before I fucking get settled. Because yeah. I think someone like him, he fit into Strike Force perfectly, and that's no disrespect to anyone in Strike Force because there was a lot of really, really talented guys. And OSP is a massively talented guy, but like you say, Ben Rothwell is a fighter. Mm -hmm. He will fucking fight you, and. I wouldn't say Roth. Uh, I wouldn't say OSP is necessarily a fighter. Fighter. He's not like if you saw him in a car park somewhere and someone upset him. I can't imagine he'd fucking throw down and be like, "Hold on a minute, you said yeah. fucking what?" Whereas Rothwell, mate, he's got a gun in his truck and a fucking rope and a shovel. You'd, you'd say no, goodbye. Yeah, for sure. yeah, for sure. It, it, but it's it, like the other one, and I'm and again, I'm not I'm not singling him out and picking on him. And I know he's had a lot of success of late when he's been in uh, in, in Bellator, but. Like Ryan Bader, like I remember how he dealt with with Anthony Johnson coming at him. Like, you know, the, like there are certain fighters they just they just don't show that that like you know the dog in the fight characteristic. No. And if you I don't have that, it just you're always going to run aground at some point. It's 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 the one ingredient I don't think you can teach it. No, you can. I think it's I think you you've got you've either got it or you haven't. I think certain life experiences and certain like backgrounds and you know environments that you grow up in could kind of encourage that that out of you you know i think we've talked about it before like i think if you're born in a more hostile environment like a more war-torn country say for example like if you've got if you've got if you're setting a character if you've got three categories on this character and you're building this character for a for a video game and you've only got a certain amount of credit so you can't put all of those three categories on full yeah like if you need a problem solver who's like, you know, like very cerebral and calculated, then you bring up certain qualities. And if you need someone that's durable and tough, you bring up other qualities. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like you got a bit of GSP, a bit of Robbie Lawler, but then you also ultimately you need that absolute fucking the, just the bite. Just the, just I think what you were saying about the, the other countries and stuff, like luckily, I've never been mugged. So being mugged is a thing that kind of bothers me because it's one of them things where I've got two small children, which are both girls. I've got my wife. I'm not a big fella. So I'm always on my guard. Now, if I had been mugged half a dozen times by the time I was 11, living in one of these, like my, my cousin, for example, my, my dad's side of the family is from Sheffield. They lived in a relatively, a really rough area in Sheffield. Not all of Sheffield's like that. It's a wonderful place. But where they lived was super rough. We were walking down the street and one bloke pulled a screwdriver out of my cousin. And literally, I pissed myself because I was about, I was on a fucking rally wolf cob. You remember the ones with the, whoop, whoop? <laughs> that was, that was me. So bear in mind where we were in Sheffield, that was like a Rolls Royce. I didn't know because I'm just some fucking kid from, from a fucking relatively posh area. So there we are, me and my cousin Gav, this kid pulls a screwdriver out. I literally piss and I'm like, oh, what do I do? 
my cousin chased them. <laughs> took his jacket off and chased them. And I was like, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm taking the screwdriver off them so they don't do it to someone else. I was like, what? But, so he's not got that confrontational jitter. Like, even though Cowboys had a million fights, he still gets that jitter, that sick feeling that... Um, you know when you know like when you're in a car and you've gone past someone or shown them up and then they pull him behind you and you sit there and think, how far are you going to follow me now, you fucking wanker? And are you going to follow me? Or how far are we going to take this? And the worst thing is, if you've ever had a confrontation with someone in a car, it's that decision you have to make to think, I've either got to get out of the car fast when they've stopped so they can't run me over. I've got to get out of the car fast before they get to me because then they're leaning over me at the door. Or I stay in the car and see if they smash the window or just call me a pussy through the window. Obviously, I've had a lot of confrontations in the car. No, but tell me about it. <laughs> the thing is, if if you even if you could be the best fighter in the world, if you're about to get out of a car, you've still got five seconds of vulnerability that someone can just fucking clink you with a tire iron. So, if I didn't have that in my stomach, that that weird gippy feeling, and that, you know that cold sweat, just that prickly like, oh fuck, it's going down. If the fight could just have started and I'm already halfway through it, I'm good. But it's it's crossing that line. And I think a lot of guys, it's it's just amplified way more because they've got to walk from the back with their family with them or people watching them, the fans and everything else. So people like Ryan Bader and everything else, it just sort of churns a little bit. And when yeah. you are on the biggest stage and there's no disputing that the UFC is the biggest stage, I would be super keen to see Ryan Bader come back. Even though I know we've spoke about him before and said he's got the worst fucking, worst nickname in the world. But I'd like to see what he does now because he's been a champ. And he's, he's, it's hard to think that Ryan Bader is the equivalent of John Jones in yeah. another organisation. Do you know what I mean? You're like, I, I mean, at one point, if you beat Ryan Bader, you got a title shot. Yeah. John Jones beat Ryan uh, beat Ryan Bader to to go and fight Shogun. Yeah, loads of people did, but it was almost like Ryan Bader is now coming back at DC, giving it some. Can you remember there was a press conference where Ryan Bader was there when DC was talking? He was like, "All right, go for it." But I'd, yeah. I'd, I'm quite keen to see him come back and see what he does because sometimes you don't see the best in a fighter until their second run or they're like true. when they're a bit older. Yeah, true, true. I just I think that. The thing is that the qualities that that I think we've seen him lack in fights that have cost him the big fights, I just I don't know whether that can be learned. You know, it was like and and again, it's like this with the uh, what's his name? Oh, I've, I've completely erased his his name from my brain. Is he got That's a not, beard? Is it Bill? No, uh, no. It's it's probably best if I'm not if, if I'm not specific. But anyway, it was a big fight. It was a high level fight. It was a top ten fight, and he tapped the strikes. Ooh. And I'm just like. And the thing is, okay, like, 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 John McDessie, when he got kicked in the face and his and his jaw was fractured, snapped. Like, okay, I mean, keep fighting if your face is turned inside out and awesome and whatever. And I don't know whether I would or not in that circumstance. I mean, adrenaline's a weird thing, but the truth is, I've literally been cut once in in my whole career. Yeah. Like. like I look at some of these guys that have been through a train wreck, and I've had like I've had five stitches. So I don't I don't honestly know how I would be in those circumstances where I am like Darren Elkins, like fucking ran into a concrete wall kind of mess, mate. I mean, like, but at the same time, like John McDessie, I no problem with that. Yeah, dude, jaw's fractured. No point in carrying on. It's only going to get worse. It's going to cause me far more problems. My recovery is going to be longer. You know. I, I have no problem with that. But, like, tapping to strikes just purely because of the pressure of the situation. Like, that's, that's like, you go back to early days UFC, like, people would tap to mount. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and big dudes. Big yeah, dudes. Like, oh, uh, fuck. I'm done. I'm done. Get me out of here. Yeah. Or as yeah. soon as they got hit, tapping. Yeah. Like, but that's like, that's, that's, to me, is not going out on your shield. No. Is it? That's like, no taking your shield out and not really wanting to get your shield dirty because someone hit it with a sword. Do you know what I mean? It's like, huh? You just dinted my shield. I'm going in. Yeah. So, I mean, the problem is there's always there's always those massive swings, though, isn't there? Like, when you look at people like Jens Pulver, like you say, Medeski, uh, Makadeski, and like Robbie Lawler when his lip had gone. I mean, who would have thought that 
Um, flipping, what's his name now? McDonald. Yeah, Rory. I forgot Rory McDonald's name the other day. Before, up to that, you wouldn't have thought that Rory McDonald was a knock him down, drag him out kind of, like just savage. No. But the problem is after after the the um, the fight, he kind of found Jesus, didn't he? Yeah. And he's and he's changed again. As it. And I don't did know if it's retired. because did he, did he talk about retiring or, or like he's doing it because he because it's his job, not because he enjoys it or something? Yeah. Well, he had a kid, and then he was talking about Jesus. Which is all good. I got no, like, if you're into religion, that's cool. That's that's your thing. But I don't know if he did that because he was worried about how much of the dark path he was going down and kind of enjoying. Do you know what I mean? Oh, a bit, a bit Anakin Skywalker. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Because well, you look at him. I mean, unfortunately, one of his best friends was the champion of his weight division for a long time. So it kind of knocked him off his little path a little bit, and that fucked his rails. Because you imagine. It's a bit like the John Jones and um, Rashad kind of thing. You, you, yeah. You're going to the same place or Chuck and Tito, whatever you want to... What, It'd have had a title shot if it wasn't for GSP being the champ, for sure. Without a doubt. And I think nine times out of ten, he probably would have won because he was a, he was yeah. so similar to GSP. Without, without GSP's karate influence and obviously, obviously Rory and GSP's dads are different dudes, but a lot of GSP's initial uh, training and disciplines were down to his dad so because i've not seen him as much on rory i don't know how that was was different but certainly a lot of his later training with faraz was all very similar to gsp do you know what i mean so i would have thought that he he'd been a pretty close guy to be the next champ but after he had the shit knocked out of him by um by robbie i mean he he had so many fights and he, he just he was such a good guy. But I think he just got to the point where he had a kid, found Jesus, and he was like, I don't really like it anymore. I'm not really into it. Yeah. The thing is, if that if that if you get to that stage, then you know, it's I have no problem with a fighter getting to that stage because it's 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 not it's not an easy life in any way, shape, or form. It's like it's difficult. Like most days are difficult. It takes a lot, it's you know, it takes a lot out of you, it takes a lot of sacrifice. And then when you have a few fights like that where your face gets busted, and the thing is with a broken nose, like, I mean, I've broken mine five times. And so, I mean, I broke it, what, like once when I was a kid, then once when I was in my early teens training, weapons training. <laughs> <laughs> I got hit with a bow staff. Knocked out my nose ring. I had a nose ring at the time as well, believe that, it. Was that your mate Mick who was responsible yeah. for that? Yeah. We, he had the bow staff, he slid it all the way down to the end of it like that. So we had the whole six foot of it behind him and then swung it over his head, hit me right on the side of the nose. And it like, chipped the top side of my nose there, came down and pulled my nose ring out. <laughs> I can, so I can feel that little that little break there. Did the nose ring ever go back in? No, no I left it out after that. It was probably... I kept, kept my tongue piercing in for a while though, but that came out when I went to China. Oh, like, I see. I bet Mick couldn't have hit that with a staff. <laughs> Like, like the worst, I think, I mean, I had mine broken in a fight, but I, I also was headbutted when I was at, when I was at school, um, like proper grabbed and headbutted. Yeah, yeah. And that was, that was, a, that was a good break. Um, but after that, it, it never seemed to break particularly badly. Yeah, but I remember it breaking once in a, in a tie boxing match, I got caught clean in the face. And um, like, it, just the sensitivity of getting punched on it every time. It's, yeah. It's not nice. You remember the last punch <laughs> Robin landed? Sorry, so, sorry, you must have it skipped a bit. Then you were saying something else. No, I just said it's just a horrible feeling. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing you think of, I mean, this is going to sound really pussy because you're not going to be able to see him because there's nothing there now. But we're doing a lot of work in the garden. I just I get a lot of splinters and things, and I sort of just carry on regardless. Just keep working through it. A bit Homer Simpsonish, but honestly, I'd. Two, one in the thumb, one in my thumb, and one in my finger the other day, and they put, they both put me to my knees. Like I don't know how far they'd gone in, but you know when someone else, like Stacey's pulling them out for me, and it's when someone else is applying pressure to something that, oh, and it's already sore, and then they're just digging with a pin or squeezing with pl tweezers, pliers. But it's fucking horrible. You imagine if something is hurting or broken at that point. Like when Tim Sylvia broke his arm against Frank Mir, and he's yeah. like. I carry on. Yeah, like, whoa! If you break your arm, you go to hospital, dude. Yeah. Like you don't carry on fighting, you fucking idiot. 
That shows you the adrenaline, though. I, I'm not even sure he felt it, to be honest. No. I'm not sure he felt it. It was bad, though, that was. But like, I, like, I, I, um, my rematch with Lee Dosky was one of my early fights in my career. I kicked him, and he blocked it with his forearm, and it broke his forearm. But he didn't realise it was broken until he threw a punch. You know what I mean? So, like, he threw a jab with it, and it was like, oh, that feels a bit weird. Did it feel like one of them snakes he used to get on a school trip? You know, when there's all the sections that you could hold out in front of you? And it... <laughs> I've got one of them somewhere, you know. You know what I mean, though, don't you? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I don't, I don't you know can what it take is. a pound on the school trip for the gift shop, and that's it. If nothing else, like, oh, <laughs> I get a wiggly snake. Fuck so, you know. shall we talk about this this uh, next load of fights? Because there were some good scraps on this one. And there was some there was some good back up. Oh, 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 hang on a minute. Come on. That's beautiful. When 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 am I getting one of them? How does how do I get something with that on? Yeah, look at that. Oh. Oh yeah. Jimmy Wallace to lose his mind. There is something else. Jimmy Wallace tattooed on his forehead. Well, we can we can cover his stomach with it. <laughs> That's Honestly. Beautiful. These are thick. They're not stickers. They're obviously the wovens. But this is the sample. And honestly, it is so fucking good. I've had this for three days. And I didn't want to send it to you until I could show you. But it is the bollocks. And the, there's a lot of new products that have been released into uh, into our industry that I'm going to get hold of and start pimping up a little bit. Now, now wheels have started moving a little bit. I've had quite a few messages of people asking how things are looking. Are we ordering getting stuff out? All I need to remind people of is there are certain things, and this is a real quick message. Yeah. If, if it's screen printed on our shop, then it's normally in stock, and I can get it out to you within a couple of days, hopefully, uh, depending on where it's stored, if it's with me or with Dan. If it's an embroidery or a patch, then a lot of the times I can't keep them massively stocked up because I don't know who's going to order what, and I can't like preempt that everyone's going to want green beanies or orange beanies or black beanies. So just give a little bit more time. But in the in the grand scheme, everyone has been super, super, super patient. Um, everyone's been really reactive. It's been nice seeing everyone in their new gear. I mean, I saw, um, is it Joe Taylor? His dad was doing Keep You Up as in one of the yeah. new shirts. That was cool. Uh, the Iron Corway, always repping Full Reptile when he's swinging around them massive fucking lollipops. Fair play to you. Um, just loads of loads of people. It's, it's been wicked to see like the uh, how people have reacted, and especially with them how patient they've been. So, it just leads me on to my last point about this. When we were in the initial stages of lockdown, people were still ordering because there was a new website. And obviously, we've said before, and I'll say again, we're super grateful to those people that have done that. But what I am going to do for everyone that has ordered, I will be sending a specific code to those people as a thank you for it's probably gonna be a 20 percent off or something free or bit of both i'm not sure yet um because i've seen that there's a few people a few places that have started putting out codes to say we are now open again 20 percent off and the problem is what i want to be able to do first is thank everyone that has supported us in this time as opposed to the people who have waited and have been like been a bit standoffish not that they don't deserve it, but obviously they can have it later. But I would rather give everyone who supported us and uh, and like still ordered, they'll be getting an email. So keep an eye out. There'll be something coming through into a. It might be in your spam. It might be wherever. But there'll there'll definitely be a code for a. Uh, and it won't be like loyalty twenty. So don't think it'll be that because it won't. So I'll. I've tried that uh, I'll, code those days and it don't work, mate. I, the amount of codes I try on different websites and sometimes they, it's like Easter 40. It's like, yeah, cool, that'll do. No, no, see, I try it on ours because I never get sent any stuff. So, you see, everyone that's uh, everyone that's going to get these these emails through is going to get their orders before I get any of the do kit. Mate, you've got literally nothing. There's nothing to bring to you. Apart from this, I'm going to bring you one patch. I need a my frosty hat. Sticker. I need my hat. Uh, yeah, yeah, you get your camo hat, you get a frosty sticker, and you get one of these. Oh, and I'm not yeah. even going to show you the other thing. Yeah. Is, that, is that right? What when, have I got? Oh, I've got old school today. I've got old school today. Yeah, me although, too. although the, the bloke at the co-op asked me what the symbol's about because he saw it on the ban outside. He said, "Is it anything to do with reptile?" I said, "I said kinda." Kinda. Is that because it says the word reptile? <laughs> <laughs> one of our suppliers, one of our suppliers who make our rubber stamps, 
that we do the coffee bags with in the swing tags was like asking me loads of questions and it's because their kids keep reptiles and i was like it's kind of the same but uh, we don't yeah. sell snakes and she was like oh okay and like from being like the most energetic interested person you've ever been speaking to to someone who's just like oh fighting fuck off don't care <laughs> she's just turned off so yeah i don't know if you lost us some money a few fights ago yeah maybe, maybe. Did, did you so, watch the uh, did you watch the card then i did fucking did i and what did you how like? good is it to have it back it's just good to have it back right yeah it's not good it's nice. Right, so let me let me because I've watched quite a few of these. Go on, then. Courtney Casey, early prelims, and the only reason it stuck out was because it was Mara Romello Barella, and the amount of times you've said that on a podcast, I was like, I can't ignore this lady. I've got to watch her. Yeah, you see, you see, I noticed that uh, Fitzy was doing a good job. He was punctuating very well, and he was going Mara. Romero Barella. He was like yeah. punctuating it much nicer. I was just, I was trying to say it too quickly because obviously, you know, I talk fast and this fight's going on. And I'm excited, and I was. It always runs into one one word for me. Yeah, uh, yeah. That was weird. I was like, like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not discrediting the technique at all, but like, surely she knew that the armbar was coming. I mean, it looked like it was, like, and, and the arena was quiet. And who was commentating? Was it Bisping and Fitzy? It yeah. was Bisping, Felder, and Fitzy. Oh, yeah, um, yeah like, I, th I even think Bisping said, oh, she set up the armbar, like 20 seconds before she even did. And he's not quiet. It's almost no. like, it's, it's almost like Courtney's like, shush, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Can we have a bit of quiet, dickhead? Yeah. Man. Yeah, well, well that, like, that was did, snake. Did, did you like the next dude, Nate Land Landwer? Wow. So <laughs> His post fight interview. He was buzzing. Mate, all yeah. of it. Drug testing. <laughs> Mate, drug <laughs> testing. And also, it, you, this is what we were talking about the other day with Henry Cejudo, right? Having a gimmick or a character. This guy does not need any help in developing a fucking character. No. Other than he looks like, if you to put a suit on him, he looks like Middle America church belt. Do you know what I mean? With that massive sweep over, side parting, but then he starts talking. And you're like, "Yo, this guy was in Boys in the Hood. What the <laughs> fuck?" I, I reckon it. I reckon it'd be one of uh, Wayne and Garth's mates of Wayne's World. Mate, you know if there was, you know if Mike Perry needed a tag team partner in the wrestling game. <laughs> Imagine. That's a good game. Let's do that. Let's make some. Let's make some tag teams out of people. I'll throw a fighter out there and you can put him as a tag team with someone. Okay. In okay, fact, well, someone on this card that would be a good tag team, his opponent, Darren Elkins and Justin Gaethje, that's a tag team for you. Dude. Right? Yes. All day. All one. man. And that was that was kind of that was kind of tough to watch because Darren Elkins was doing what Darren Elkins does the best at first. Yeah. And they and the thing is that Nate guy, he seems a lot like Darren Elkins, but He's just not had the 15 years worth of battle damage because he's relatively new in the game. Do you know what I mean? But he looked yeah. good, man. I'm excited. And the thing is, I am pumped to see him fight again. I mean, he's, I say he's new in the game. He's 31 and he's had, what, 17 fights? Yeah, I actually don't, don't know what his record is. I've got, hang on, I've got the Wikipedia page pulled up here and that's no good at all because okay. I need topology. He's got I don't use Sherdog anymore. I use Sherdog all the time. What did you I'm say? Dog. I'm on Sherdog now, but it keep, it's got a, a pop-up blocker and shit, so I'm going to be moving over, I think. I can't but be doing the damn thing anymore. It, they, always, they always want something popping up on shit. I used to live on Sherdog, mate. I used to always have Sherdog, Cage Warriors, and Hotmail open. That was my three tabs. Oh, it's, it's okay. 13 and 3. 14 and 3. Uh, 14 and 3, sorry. I've been fighting for M1. Is that right? Oh, no, yeah. it's okay. M1 Challenge. M1 so Challenge. Been, been in... Uh, are these fights all been in um, in uh, Russia then? I'm not sure. Yeah, M1's Russia. M1's a Russian event, isn't it? Oh, Kazakhstan. So well, he lost, have been he lost to Herbert Burns in, with a quick knee. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I know. Yeah, of course he did. That's no surprise. That's I mean, Gil Burns' brother, isn't it? 
I'm just looking yeah. at some of his fights, though. He's had he's kind of been fighting all over the place. But, but he had a lot of his recent fights before he made his UFC debut. He was fighting M1 Challenge. Yeah. Which is like Russia, Kazakhstan. Yeah, Nuslut and Kazakhstan. They're tough motherfuckers. That's the, that, That's what you're talking about, having a tough upbringing, right? thing is, his personality can't really shine out there, can it? Because he's, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you don't get his, you, you, they, I don't think they'd appreciate his personality quite as much as what will come across in his UFC post-fight interviews. <laughs> I thought he was hilarious. I, I really enjoyed him. I just can't wait for him to get together with Mike Perry and get an eyebrow tattoo, get his hair like cornrowed, and yeah. then just come out in like a big fluffy pimp jacket and a cane. Go on then. So, so who do you tag team with um, uh, Tony Ferguson? Oh, man. It's got to be a lot of eyeliner and heavy mascara. Who am I going with Tony Ferguson? You know I'm going with Tony Ferguson? Matt Brown. <laughs> Why am I Matt Brown? Because he's proper, he's into like heavy thrash metal. And I, I'm just seeing like a really dark, long trench coat, fakely glasses, not Oakley's, his blue BMX gloves. And Mike Brown can be the more, Matt, Matt Brown, sorry, not Mike Brown, Matt Brown. He Matt, can Matt be Brown the more. Serial killer edge to him, you mean? Yeah. Oh, completely. Do you not think? Oh yeah, no, no. I can see it. I can see. I can see it. It's like a. It's like a Jay and Silent Bob combo. That is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Go on, yeah. else you got? Who else you got? So, um, let me throw you one. Let me on. throw you one. Let me see who I've got. Okay, okay. Let me see who's on here. Andre Olovsky. Andre Olovsky. I bring. Um, I'd bring Vladimir Matyushenko out of retirement and I'd have them as like like Bond villain hitman. I'd have them both come to the octagon in like suits with dark shades and briefcases. And when they get to the octagon, I'd have them pop the case, put the code in, pop the case and get their gloves out and put them on. Nice. Would the suit be a real suit or would it be a picture of a suit printed on a rash vest? Oh, now you're talking Dr. John Danaher's language. Do you know what I mean? He's just living that thing. <laughs> <laughs> All his outfits are just like sublimated printed on there. I'm going to the beach. Here's my torso. <laughs> Here's my suit. Man, there's a lot of there's a lot of good people you can put together, but the the problem is, no matter who we put together, now off the cuff. Someone's going to put some really good ones in the fucking comments and you're going to be like, oh yeah, that's made me look like a twat. But these are off the cuff. These aren't just fucking... That's true. Well, the thing is, if people put them in the comments, then what we can do is we'll think of a tag team partner to go against the tag team partner that they've suggested. One that yes. we think will beat them. Yeah. And, and like it's going to be, with, like going to be within a weight class. That's, that's going to be the rule, I think. Oh yeah, you within can't... Have... Weight class. Like you can go, you can go a lightweight with a welterweight or a heavyweight with a light heavyweight, yeah. you can't do weight classes further apart. They've got to be navy weight classes. That's the rule. Yeah. yeah. Or if there is one where you want a lady fighter, yeah. and you don't want to do a tag team, you could think of a dude as her manager, like Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. Can you remember him? Mm -hmm. The guy you put on the megaphone. Or a dude with a lady manager like Miss Elizabeth. I like it. There you I go. Like I mean, perfect but i mean the, the shevchenkos are an obvious one aren't they i mean they're like uh they're they're, they're like a ready-made tag team i'd quite like them to have a whole storyline where they're foes though like the the adidas brothers oh okay okay i can see that because then like like kane and the undertaker or like the adidas brothers adidas and puma where they come back together i'd, I'd quite like to see how that could work because they're both badasses aren't they <laughs> yeah yeah and you don't want you don't want unbeatable squeaky clean, even no. if you are writing the script. No. So so who so who's Ben Rothwell's um, who's Ben Rothwell's uh, tag team partner? There are no partners for Ben Rothwell. He <laughs> he would eat them. He doesn't he doesn't he does not play well with others at all. He does not play well with others. I told you before he's got a truck with a gun, a rope, and a shovel. He's not fucking around, and that's just to collect pizza. Yeah. See, that's, that's, okay, so th this, that's this week's game. We'll discuss next week when we do the podcast, the tag team partners that have come in. Next week, we're going to discuss what heavyweight fighter would you pair with a 
bantamweight or below to sit on their shoulders and play Braveheart. Yes. I went, oh, to, a, I went to a gig once, right? I went to a gig at Rock City once, and it was Candiria. Sick of it. It might have been sick of it all. I can't remember. It was a hardcore punk gig, whatever. And there was this point where and rock, the downstairs in Rock City, the ceiling was quite low. So if you're sitting on someone's shoulders, you're, you're nearly at the lighting rig anyway. Yeah. So you're kind of careful. But what they did, before between songs, they stopped. They divided the whole crowd in two on, in, in the pit. They had everybody turn and face each other. So basically had two armies on either side. They called this Braveheart. And then they had, they had some people on the front row sit on the other people's shoulders. And they'd start playing the song. And then when the drums kicked in, they just just fucking run at each other. Amazing. Carnage. That that was one of the moments where I realized that it's probably best for me to take a back step because if I get a stray elbow, I'm gonna have yeah. to pull out of my next three fights that are already booked. Or if you kill someone on someone else's shoulders. <laughs> there's a fella with a red mohawk. Knock three people out. Clink. Just take it way too seriously. Yeah. Shot in a pool cue on the on the uh, on the road outside. <laughs> This, it's not that serious. Open up like a red stripe can, just peeling it open. I've got a shank, dude. Like it's it's not that serious. Calm down. Nah, it, the trouble so, is, all my friends were short. So if I'd have been on someone's shoulders, we'd have still only been up to someone else's fucking chest. <laughs> you just had to have a long trench coat. Yeah, we needed three of us. We would have had to completely totem pole it. <laughs> I'm sure that's a weird sexual innuendo somewhere that we don't know. Yeah, it's not even that weird, is it? It's quite clearly a, a, a bad one. <laughs> anyway, anyway, Go on. Who's next? So that was Nate. Centipede direction, which I don't even want to get. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. So, Nate, looking forward to that, dude. He was fucking brilliant. Um, then... So what about the decisions? What about the controversial decisions? We what had Gidea fuck? against Hill was an odd one. Angela Hill won that, right? And Angela was... Hill won all day. Yeah. All day. Especially I mean, she had a knockdown. I mean, she scored a knockdown. Was it the second round? Well, Bis Big even said that. The first round she got she got um taken down, but not for the whole round. Yeah. So she was still she was still competitive. Plus Ten, the second round lost the first round. Yeah, lost the first, but completely won the second with that knockdown. And then the third, she just dominated with striking. Because Claudia, she looked tired. She she looked like she'd put yeah. a lot into that first round. And unfortunately it hadn't worked out. And Angela just looked on fire. So yeah. Quite understandably, she was fuming when that when that was read. Yeah. Uh, Marlon Vera. Yeah, I thought he won that one as well. I thought he took the last two rounds. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, that was but, a weird one. That I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Because the thing is, I was expecting, I was expecting judges' decisions to be more accurate in this time, given the fact that you know you can hear what's going on a bit more and. I don't know. I mean, even like if the fighters can hear the commentators, then the judges can hear the commentators as well. And I would, and I would say, oftentimes the the commentators will know more what they're seeing than than a lot of the judges will. Because well, I mean, I don't know who these judges are, but it's very rare that you get someone that's got MMA experience sitting no, there. They're just and they're trained to be judges, wow. and that's and that's great. But at the same time, I don't know. I, I think I think sometimes you do. It's kind of difficult for me to say this because it's not like. You don't have to be a fighter to be a great coach. But if no. you're a great coach that was never a fighter, that's that's unusual in my eyes. Yeah. Because there's a, there are benefits to having that experience, real-life experience. Well, yeah. And over and doing it yourself, uh, coaching it yourself. Same thing with, with commenting, with what you're watching. I do think there's a point where if you've sat Octagon side enough and watched enough MMA, especially live MMA, right in front where you're judging, so you're tuned in, I do think that you can you can really develop that skill. Like the judges that we have doing Cage Warriors, like Ben Cartledge and the like, they they do a great job because they are there all the time. They compare notes after the events and stuff. But like I like this 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 still always it's always I always think there should be at least one of the judges that's had some fight experience. Or, it just or, seems you know maybe that's another thing that we try where we have a separate judging panel that, of, of ex fighters and see how they score it. It just seems massively disjointed. It seems like, like when I was telling you the other day about that documentary on Netflix, there's a documentary on Netflix called How to Something a Crime Lab or a Drug Fucking. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's brilliant. It's interesting, but it's one of the documentaries. But it just showed you in America, in a certain, certain areas of America, 
if you get pulled over with drugs, the police don't retain the drugs. The police send the drugs to an independent crime lab or an independent drugs testing facility. Now, I'm under the impression, and I might be wrong, that in England, we have an in-house testing facility because of that. So it's not all franchised off. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot, what I find in America is a lot of things are franchised off so that it's just like, a lot of it is like a, a backhand shake that people are looking after their mates or whatever to make sure they've got like other little avenues. But what I'm, what I'm getting at is it's not just a job. It's not just something that anyone can apply for and be like, oh yeah, I can judge that because it's far more it's far more detailed than that. Like if you don't know what a Kimura, an armbar, or a fucking takedown is, or anything else, and you can't, and you've got no appreciation or understanding of the of the art, then how the fuck are you judging it? Mm. Because it's not like you can't go and put a fucking you can't go and I don't know be a referee at a football match or any sort of other sporting event and just be like, well, I applied for the job and they said I was qualified. Because you need experience. You need to know what's happening and why it's happening that way. But yeah. It and would... the other thing as well is being held accountable. Like, that's one thing that I don't understand why. Like, it seems like it's common sense, especially because their their very purpose is to judge. Like, they're there to judge other people. So the fact that they then get in their car and go home and we're all talking about why did they make that decision. Like, yeah. they are judges. So explain to us why you made that decision. Yeah, they could, they could have quite easily after this event sat the three judges down at a panel at a board uh, in you know at the press conference and said okay explain to because what were there three weird decisions on this oh, round? Oh and yeah, to be honest, was... I didn't have a problem with Danny Ige one. I still I felt like he won that. Um, I yeah, it was close. Back, I'd have to watch it back, but I thought I thought Vera and Hill both won their fights. Yeah, I, and I would have hold on. Yes, I definitely, definitely, Angela Hill, I thought won, and uh, Vera, I thought won. Barbosa, I think at the time I remember having him win it, but for whatever reason, when I watched it, I'd seen half the fight and I had to stop to do something else. And then when I watched it again, uh, sorry, I watched the whole fight and then I had to stop watching the event because I was doing something with the kids. Then when I come to watch the the rest of the event, it played it again, and I'd seen it all like halfway through. So it sort of started it from where I'd left it before. Yeah, so I did watch it twice, and I sort of I could have given it either way, but I felt Barbosa, if I was scoring it, won it. But right. I didn't have a massive problem with it either way. It wasn't as close as like Hill and uh, Claudia. No, I'll have to watch it back. I will say Barbosa looked good though. He, yeah. he looked he looked good at the weight. I was surprised because I thought he was going to really struggle with that. I, and I mean, ten pounds is a lot when you've not got any body fat on your frame already. No, like when he fought Felder in, in the Middle East, like they were shred both of them. Yeah. Like there was they, they, they couldn't have been five percent body fat in the in the cage no. if you uh, take the referee out of the equation. It was ridiculous. But not many kicks, right? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But Danny, but the thing His is, explosiveness was lost in in the weight cut, perhaps. Maybe. I then, think, you know, it was his first go, though, wasn't it? It was his first fight at weight at 145. Yeah. He's not yeah. been there before. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it's nice that because obviously not not everyone knows who Danny Gay is, and he's a bit of a savage. So I think sometimes when these controversial decisions do happen, it, it makes a fighter stick in your mind a bit more. Because with someone like Nate Landwer, he was screaming and shouting. He was fight, shouting 50 Gs, baby, shouting Dana and all this stuff, which... He's already putting his own little character into place, which makes you remember him. Whereas Dan Ige is not that vocal, mm -hmm. necessarily. He's a fantastic fighter. But the next time he fights, you're going to be like, fuck, this is the guy who had that controversial decision against Barboza. OK, let's go. And I think sometimes the universe has got a way of doing that that just draws you in and gives that person a bit more of a narrative. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Right. Rather than just being like, oh, he's just a fighter. Yeah. Or, yeah, what, so. what about the main event? What about... Um... Over him and Harris. It kind of felt it, it was a weird pressure cooker of emotion, obviously with the Walt Harris side of things. Mm. And I think three out of six referees would have stopped that. Yeah. I think I think that could have been stopped. And I think Overeem would have been cool with that. Overeem would have hugged him and told him, let's train together, like he did after he beat him. But he he caught him and he and he used a massive amount of energy. 
Um, I mean, obviously, we've had three events now, and every event, no matter who's commentating, the the focal point has really been listen to the breathing. Mm-hmm. Listen to the breathing. And obviously, you know, it's like you've been running enough gyms that you hear someone that's absolutely fucked. And he was he was absolutely smoke, man, because obviously he's just he's just dropped over him. And and the problem is it's not just dropping someone, it's then trying to remain calm and finish them. But also there's gotta be a lot of excitement in there, like, I fucking did it. It's yeah. like unlocking a special move. Like, yeah, you might have done the move, but now you need to finish off the last that last little bit. And how many times have you played a fighting game where there's that much energy on your opponent and they just clip you and you're done? Yeah. And it's and it's that kind of thing, isn't it? Like you yeah, yeah you're winning, you're massively winning, but then oh you took your eye off the ball and it was kind of heartbreaking for him because unfortunately with his with the with the story that's that's with behind Walt at the minute, the fact that he's found a little bit of um normality and being able to train and that he's doing it for his late uh, stepdaughter and all this amazing stuff that he's really focused into. Like if it was one of the other referees that would have stopped that, it would have made it such an amazing thing. But unfortunately, it wasn't. Yeah, and he didn't that get the win. Referee though, not to get to, not to get too involved. Because I mean, the thing is, and this is where I, I think I, I always say this about heavyweight, like experience is, plays a much bigger factor at heavyweight, and that was that was Alistair Overeem's experience showing through. Because I would say he was more hurt in the first round. And, and damaged and nearly out of the fight than Harris was when the fight was stopped. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. His, you know, his ability to stay calm and to know how to, to not take much more damage and like, that's that's what kept him in, in the fight. And and, the, and and Harris, he just, he didn't show that kind of composure in that occasion. But then, you know, you've got to think, like you said, all of the pressure on him. Like, you just don't know where his mind was at, what was going through his head. Like you said, like you see you over him go down how many times did he visualize, uh, you know, winning the fight, and how many times did he lent on that visualization to give him strength in times when he was struggling? Yeah, I mean, like he was, he was kind of he, he, the odds were stacked against him. I did think that when I was watching it, I'm like, they're, they're talking about the, you know, the tragedy a lot, and this is, uh, you know, like so, someone texted me and they said that, you know, they hope they, that he's not watching the feed in his locker room while he's warming up. Yeah, no way. It oh, would, it would be very, very difficult. So. Yeah, as as a as a father, I physically can tell you I wouldn't be able to leave the house. So the fact that he achieved what he achieved, it sort of just broke my heart a little bit that he didn't get the cherry, because I don't feel the win does anything massively for Overeem's career, and I don't think the loss does anything either massively for his career. But and I'm not saying I'm never endorsing fixing fights or anything like that, but it was almost that dream sequence. It was almost a dream sequence of him going out there, finding this new energy, finding this fucking, this glimmer of hope in such a shit storm of fucking hell that then he's gone clink and everyone's like, and it was the you against um, bang fight. Hey, oh fuck. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and every, every part of me was like, come on, come on, come on, come on. You've got it, you've got it, you've got it. And then literally, like you say, Overeem's just been there so many times. I mean, we've seen him, we've seen him stopped. And he looks like he's been hit with less. You've seen you've seen Overeem's lights go out with less. It's like like Olovsky. Olovsky was fighting again, wasn't he? But the yeah. amount of times you see Olovsky stopped with next to nothing, that now he gets hit. You're like, hold on a minute. How the fuck have you developed such a yeah. chin? Do you know what I mean? It's, it's weird, isn't it? It's it's so strange how some shots like look like there's nothing on them, and people are like are knocked off their feet, like completely out. And other times they they they're taking what look like to be massive shots. And are just marching through like it's yeah. not. It is. It is. It's. It's a strange thing. The human body. A lot it's of a strange thing. The, the, one thing I, I will say on that because I had a bit of a. I was thinking about this while I was doing the research for DC against Mirchic, and, and I'm thinking to myself, how did Mirchic go five rounds with Ngannou? Yeah. I mean, and I'm not saying that he spent the whole time in vulnerable positions where he could have been knocked out, but. There were five opportunities for Ngannou to knock him out. He went the distance. Yeah. So how did he not get knocked out against Ngannou and some of the other guys that he's fought that are, that are bigger punches than DC is known as? Yeah. And then DC clips him and knocks him out. And and I, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if there's something in the anticipation of the person that you're fighting being heavy-handed. 
Yeah. I, I, I know if I'm fight, if I was fighting a big puncher and they're throwing, I'm like, I'm ready for that punch to impact because I know it's going to be a, a big shot. Whereas if I'm fighting someone that's, that's got no power in their hands, yeah, I will go into that fight. Like, part of my problem with Condit, like, and I, I know he's a great striker. I just didn't respect his power because no one had hurt me up to that no. point. So I just thought to myself, well, okay, whatever. And I was more interested in putting big power into my shot instead of keeping my guard tight and throwing it nice and clean. Just, you know what I mean? It's one of those things where I think sometimes the anticipation of being hit with big shots is a, is a good way of kind of like riding that power a little bit, being more prepared for it. Like the body kind of braces for it when you see it coming. Whereas like when, when, when Mirchich locks up with DC, he's not expecting a little right hand over the top to knock him out. No. He's just not ready for it, not braced no. for it. You know, I think there is something to do with that. And that is that sneaky, because it, it's like with uh, Nganu, you almost you expect it every time. The worst thing is, with the anticipation now of expecting it, we know that he can show up and do that because he's done it on so many occasions. But we also know there's the Derek Lewis effect. Do you know what I mean? So it sort of, it can, they can almost counteract each other, I suppose. Like, look at when you fought Rumble. I know Rumble wasn't known as much as a big, as a as a, a heavy-handed guy as he was towards the end of his career. I mean, he'd knocked out that guy with that head kick. Dude, and- I was, I was the, literally the only welterweight he didn't knock out. Yeah. He knocked everybody out. So how did that affect you then? Did that... Well, I mean, the thing is, I, I kind of... You had a good relationship with him, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we did, we'd done signings together for tap out and stuff, and we all, we always got on. Like Rumble's a wicked guy, right? We always got on really well, and, and always had good conversation when we were working together and stuff. And I was coming off the first knockout of my career, and the UFC had matched me up against the biggest puncher in the division. So my thought in like like when because then there was a switch in main event. It was originally was it Tito against Nagira? Yeah, I, I think Tito pulled out and was replaced with Phil Davis. Yes. And when that happened, I got a message from Rumble saying, we, you know, we should have been put into the main event. You know, let's have a great fight and steal the show. And then we had a couple of messages back and forth during training camp. But in, in my head, I'm thinking, why, why would he grapple with me when he's the biggest puncher in the division? I've just been knocked out. Yeah. Like, if I'm a, if I'm a knockout artist and I'm fighting someone that's just been knocked out, I'm like, I'm just replicating this. I'm just going to knock him out. Yeah. Like, just, it, it seems like, like half of the job's already done if they've just been knocked out. So I, I just, I thought he would, he, he would fight like that. So I kind of, I went into that fight, like anticipating it, I was going to be taking heavier shots. So, so like, I mean, part of my game plan was to kind of get into a fight, to make him work, to kind of tire him out because I knew I had to go the long game. I wasn't going to meet him force with force in the early rounds. No. I wanted to meet him. I wanted to meet force with fatigue and slow yeah. him down. But I tell you what, there was a kick that he hit me with in the first round and it didn't even hit me. It didn't hurt me. It didn't hit me clean on the head or anything. But just p- the pure power and weight of his leg knocked me off my feet. I remember. It just it caught me here. I'm like, geez. Like, I remember hitting the floor thinking, my God. But you think he I'm was... Still not in the right position after that yeah, fight. Yeah, dude. Honestly, like, that's a well, that's a heavy well, heavyweight in a, a what weight class is that? Welterweight body. Yeah, only just. That's fucking insane. But it's almost it's almost like that anticipation, I suppose, of you just have to get through it a little bit. And I think that almost came through in the the Walt Harrison Overeem. It's almost like it's like surviving a car crash a bit. You know when something horrific has happened, and before you know it, fifteen seconds has passed, and twenty five punches have been thrown. Not all of them have landed, but it's that car crash sort of thing that you just come out the other side. I'm all right. And it's a weird sort of way you look over him looked really hurt and Walt looked really busy, but it just it wasn't enough, unfortunately, yeah. to, to to put that away. So I don't know, man. It was um I was kinda I was just it was yeah, it was overly emotional for the uh for the, the whole thing because obviously it was uh it was an interesting story, but it was it was kinda heartbreaking to see him not win. And especially when because then over him lent over and he said, Look, we'll train together. And you used to hear that a lot. There used to be a lot of guys, especially in early days of MMA, where they'd be like absolute fucking rivals. They're like, let's get together, dude. Like they could have come out absolutely fucking blood soaked. It's like, come to my gym. You, we're, we're boys now. That's it. We're not like the, it's like the equivalent of Eskimo brothers. Do you know what I mean? But they're like, 
then now that's it for life. Right? Whatever we do moving forward, we're together. Yeah. The thing is, you do you can you do kind of develop a bit of a bond with someone that you spent that amount of time with, especially when you're locking horns with someone. You you find a respect for them. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I went up to Montreal three times to help help George train for his fights, and and that surprised me when he when he, when they contacted me to to be honest. But um, at the same time, it makes sense in hindsight, and especially once I got up there and I got to know George and the kind of person that he was, and like I mean, he was. It was it was all about martial arts. It was it was not about it was much less about fighting. Yeah, they, like they were the they were the the, the exams during the, the martial arts journey to test your progress. Yeah, and it was much more about sharing that journey and, and sharing martial arts. I always respected that about him because there were so many gyms you walk into, and it's like like immediately these fucking these teeth everywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like everyone's like everyone's on edge and like. You know, you, you know you're going to be in for a hard training session, even if you're not sparring. Well, uh, yeah. Whereas that it, that wasn't the case there, and I, and I always appreciated that. And I think that I think in the early days, especially because there were so few mixed martial artists around, like if you had a fight with someone and and like they were a good test, you were like, dude, like you've got some cool skills that I've never seen before. Yeah. Like let me show you these things that I caught you with, and yeah. you show me. You know what I mean? It's like. I, I I loved that about the early days of MMA, but I mean, obviously now now everything's far more accessible without that cross training with other people. Yeah, I think I think the only real benefit in that now it, it comes to sparring, and that's got to be managed. And that that takes me back to a point I forgot I to make earlier about Ovin Sempru. I, I can't think of anybody else from his gym. No, like he like in my opinion, I would if I'm his coach, I'm taking him on a trip to another gym that's got a bunch of big guys. They're going to push him around and bully him. Yeah, you know what I mean. He needs to be in a bit of a shark tank. I mean, there are yeah. plenty of guys in Vegas that could that could do that. Like, imagine Ovin St. Prue going to Vegas and getting some rounds in with the uh, Engano. Exactly. Or just leaving him in a really bad neighborhood and just letting him walk through it. Like go old, like Jean Claude Van Damme training. Do you know what I mean? Just it's it's having it's yeah, having. A quick a little... When he decides he's moving, he's he's taking off. You couldn't catch him in a in a Mustang. <laughs> Imagine all his gangs. It's in their on Honestly, I'm surprised he's never jumped out of the octagon. To be honest, yeah, that's it. He's got that natural ability, and I suppose it's like you say, you just can't, you can't teach hunger or well, not hunger, grit. That 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 absolute that like the Diaz brothers. Yeah, like win, lose or draw, they've always won in their head, right? They always won, like. It doesn't matter if GSP's beat you. It doesn't matter if fucking Johnny Hendricks, anyone. It doesn't matter who they've beat you. You're still a motherfucker after it. And even if you beat BJ Penn, you're still giving it the same <laughs> as if you've lost to fucking someone. So, I don't know. I mean, I think all to, I think everyone's got their little bit of fire, but it's not always in where they need it to be. So I've not got that same fire in fighting. I just haven't. I've never, I've never particularly liked confrontation. I've dealt with it if I've had to. But it's not been something that I've looked out for. Whereas I've I've got that hunger in other areas. Do you know what I mean? And maybe maybe OSP has it in in somewhere else. Like that yesterday, putting that fence in, it was not going to beat me. And I know, like on a podcast now, it's easy to say, oh yeah, it was just a fucking fence. But dude, that was eleven bays all going like between two and three foot deep in the heat of the sun. Just took me and another dude. And the problem is, yeah, we could have chopped the we could have chopped the fence posts off. That's a trick that people know about. Chop the fucking fence posts off. You don't have to dig as far, which is stupid. I can't feel like I'm cheating myself. So that sort of you have to do it is how I've always been. And I think that's what makes me fall out with the kids a lot because I grew up with n- nothing like what they have. And so now when they go in and they'll get themselves something that I didn't have and they don't like they left a wrapper on the side the other day. I don't mean like 50 Cent was sat in the kitchen. I mean like a, a, a sweet wrapper, a paper. And they left it on the side. I was like, yo, do you want to stick that? And they've been like, yeah, grab it while you're in there. Uh, what's that, roommate? Grab it while I'm in there? Are you on fucking glue? <laughs> Fuck. Fuck's sake. Do you know what I mean? We're not roommates, bro. Like, you are my kid. Just handle your business. And I think I'm, I'm way up. partial. Huh? Flat feet baseball cap. You look too young. Yeah, but if I go up to them like this, yeah, they'll, you, they'll be terrified. 
They're going to think I've just come back from Manji. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lion in the fucking bedroom. Do you I know what I mean? Wilson when you take your ass off like that. Who? Wilson. Oh, yeah. yeah the, off Castaway. It's just like a volleyball. I'm going to get a red handprint. That's going to be a sticker that's released. Jesus. So what have we got next? What's next? What's what's coming well, we'll up? Save it because we've got uh, we've not got anything this weekend, have we? So we'll have to talk about. And that card's still coming together. I mean, it's got what eight, seven fights on at the moment. So we've got to give it a minute for it to come together. It's good though. It's you know Woodley against Gilbert Burns. I'm very excited for. I'm going to do a. Um, I'm going to do a uh, war room for that one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean the rest of like. I'm, I'm going to look into some of the other ones because there's some fights on the card that I know one fighter really well and then the other fighter I'm, I'm a bit unsure about. Like Smolker, obviously, I know him well. Uh, oh, okay. Elliot, you know, so both of them could potentially be in really good fights. Um, Tim Elliott's the man. I love to, I, I love it. Didn't Tim Elliott run through the Ultimate Fighter season? Yeah, then, he uh, led to uh, DJ, didn't he, in, these, in his chart of the title. We look he good, though. One as well, Blagoy Ivanov. He made his debut against JDS, didn't he? Yes. He's got that gnarly scar on his chest. Yes, that that is look that is apparently from some kind of accident, or that you don't have a an, an accident as symmetrical as that. No, that's uh, like that's like when a cement he's, truck. Hit. He's genuinely been in some James Bond type shit. Yes, and he's had to go to a vet. Like all these gangster guys seem to know a vet that will sort out your problems, don't they? Do you know what I mean? I'm not being funny. I've got three dogs, and I've visited the vets quite regularly. If I got shot on like a money heist or some shit. I'm definitely not going to our vets because <laughs> I don't know. They just don't seem gangster enough for me. Maybe I'm using the wrong vets. Maybe I'm I not think, in the right fucking line. I think if I, if I remember correctly, you've always got to go to a, to someone that works with horses, like horse racing veterinarian. Like equest, is it equestrian? Equestrian, yeah. Equestrian veterinarian is what you need because then obviously, you know, that's that's legit. Like no one's gonna let you work on a horse if, unless you don't unless you know what you're doing. Today you have made your mum proud by referencing ballast and cement, grown up, and equestrian veterinarian, and you didn't slur one bit, my friend. You smashed the tits off of that, so fair play. That's it. I'm taking the rest of the day off. That's I've, it. Been, I've, I've been organizing my Lego as well. My Lego's slowly coming together. Nice. I'll tell you what I'm going to do because I've been wanting to do this for a little while because I've got this nice little workstation now and I have bought myself a fancy little camera. Yeah. So I'm going to do some, I'm going to do some Lego builds. Some time lapse. Yeah, because I've got some cool sets. Like I got, uh, Veronica bought me um, the two. So I've got the Boba Fett helmet. Ooh. And it came out. And then the other two, the TIE Fighter Pilot and Stormtrooper helmets. That I've got them. Nice. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to set the camera up and just unbox them and build them because they're they're fucking really cool sets. And because they're limited edition, if you didn't get them and you want to see what they look like, you know what I mean? I can... Uh, you missed out. We'll have, we'll have to do some, some full reptile Lego builds. I'm, I'm desperate for them to sponsor me. Can you imagine that? Dude. I'm like, well, if they sponsor you, they're sponsoring me as well. And then if I, if I stop saying really bad swear words, it's for one reason only. <laughs> I'm now a Lego kid. Is that well, it? Would, would you give up swearing for a Lego sponsorship? Oh, that's a question. The, the thing is, right, I did elocution lessons and I got my I got my grade five speech and drama certificate, which is like in the in in the in the guilds of that sort of world. That's quite a fucking achievement, right? Did you get a badge to, to sell on your trunks? I got a certificate, man. I got a certificate that's like and I passed with honours. I didn't just pass like, oh, yeah, he can speak rate right, good. I passed really well. You need and, to put that up at the office, mate. Well, it's at my mum's house. It's at my mum's house at the minute. And when I was at work, when I worked in the bank, I, I was on the phones a lot. So I can, I can turn it on and off. But what I just always find a problem with not being real or not being true. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, there's a lot of swear words that I'll filter out if I'm with someone's nan. But then at the same time, because it's only me and you talking, I'm not considering the amount of people that are going to listen to this. I don't mean to offend anyone, but I just... It's just words. So I, I struggle to hold them back when I'm just being me. But if it came down to a Lego sponsorship, fuck yeah. Sign me up, man. I'm, I'm all over that stuff. I don't think I could do it, man. I don't think I could do it. No. No. I, don't, I, don't, I just don't think I'd be able... Because the thing is, like, because I'm, because I'm not bothered about it, and I, like, and I, I just try and forget that my mum listens to the podcast. 
like if I swear from time to time, I don't I don't really tend to think about it too much. But if I know for sure I can't, yeah, that's a problem. Especially if they took it back. Imagine that, fucking shit, lords. Imagine oh. having a shelf of all my new gear, like I don't know, Millennium Falcon, the fucking um, Death Star, anything. It could be the Lion King and the Little Mermaid. I don't care. I still build it. And if I said shit fuck or something one too many times and then a wagon came down the road that was red yellow white and black oh no like, oh what's this danish motherfucker we told you give beep, it back no nah, i'll be ringing jimmy mate jimmy come to protect it <laughs> mr wallhead i will give you one of these rough house patches if you beat the shit out of that truck it'd be like that bonus stage in street fighter just jimmy just beating the shit out of a lego truck <laughs> <laughs> That, that's my goal. Oh, well, if you're going to do a time lapse of um, Lego, I need to do this. So I'll show you a picture of this hash brown that I made. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at that. You should have done time lapse of your fence build. <laughs> I don't want that to be a part of my life anymore. Anyway. It's slowly deteriorate throughout the day and just got more and more filthy. Honestly, mate, well, when I rang you and you saw my face, you, you saw that was genuine exhaustion. That was That was close to death as I need to be. A lot of people, though, message me to ask me about the recipe. So I'm going to do, I'm going to do, because I've obviously I've got a few little specialities that I do. One of them is my hash browns, which I'll do a video and I'll send it to Mystery. And if he feels it's worthy to go on the channel, it can go on the channel because hash browns aren't meat. Now, I know that there's a lot of people that follow us that are vegan or uh, whatever lifestyle you choose. I'm not. I eat a load of cool, funky shit. So I appreciate you probably aren't going to want to put burgers on there. However, everyone can appreciate a hash brown. So that's my safest option for if a, if a vegan or vegetarian is coming around to visit me, even though it's probably got some like cow hoof in it or something. But I'll, uh, I'll do that. I'll, I'll get it all drawn up so people can see. Because I started messaging Gerd to tell him how I've made them. And I was just like, oh, fuck this. I'll just record it and show him. Yeah. Do you it. Know what I mean? Do it. Exactly. So I'll do that. I'll do that with the kids. I'll get them to wear face masks so you can't tell who they are. Like Michael Jackson's kids in that documentary. We're like, blanket. Yeah. Oh, I, I've got an idea which I'll, I'll tell you about after the call because I don't want someone to rob it, but I think it's a good one. Okay. So we'll uh, so so we'll, we'll wrap this now and we'll say goodbye to everyone so I can tell you this idea because now I can't stop thinking about it. Can we say goodbye to everyone like it's Rainbow from the eighties? Where we say bye bye everybody. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bye bye, Owen. Bye bye, Raptors. <laughs> bye bye. Boo 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 boo